I'm Dr. Edward Lanieski, board certified orthopedic surgeon in Brighton, Michigan. I've been involved in cell based therapy since 2005 and have done over 4,000 of these procedures. I've had the wonderful opportunity of getting to know some of the best researchers, some of the best patients, some of the best people involved in cell based therapy since 2005. And I'd like to share that with you so that you can understand where we were, where we are now, and where we're going. So join us in Profiles of Cellular Healing. So welcome to Cellular Healing as we are talking today with Dr. Thomas Nabity. He's actually a junior. Uh, he's uh, well-versed in regenerative medicine as he runs the Michigan Center for Regenerative Medicine that's in Rochester Hills, Michigan. And their website is at regenerativemedicinemichigan.com. He's also partners with Dr. John Santa Anna, uh, and he's dual board certified um, in PMNR, or physical medicine rehab and pain medicine. Uh, he is a Mustang, he came from uh, SMU, and then he went on to University of Nebraska and he did his uh, internship, residency, and fellowship at Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak, Michigan. And he's st still currently with uh, Michigan Neurology Associates, where he was the director of physical medicine, uh, rehab, and pain. And he's had some training at uh, Rejuve. And also, he's a member of the IOF. Um, and we have a common friend, uh, Dr. Ted Sand, uh, who helped set up his lab. And this is how I got introduced uh, to Tom. Um, and today what we're going to talk about is uh, a very uh, important event in regenerative medicine, I believe, because this helps separate out the good players from the bad players. And that is happens to do with a article that a lot of my patients have seen and my colleagues have seen by Denise Grady of the New York Times, um, June 10th, and um, it has to deal with a, a um, recent ruling by the FDA um, that they went to court and the judge went ahead and ruled against a certain uh, stem cell clinic, if you will, or regenerative clinic in Florida that's called U.S. Stem Cell. And there's an infamous uh, person there by the name of Kristen Comella, who I actually worked with at one point. Uh, who uh, did push the boundaries and did use uh, adipose tissue in the form of what's called a stromovascular fracture, or, or SVF. That means that you, you dissolve the fat around the stem cells. And it's actually not the stem cells themselves, but the, where the stem cells hang out, which are the little vascular fractions of your fat, and made it into like a little pellet and that has a lot of stem cells in it and then that would be injected either into the area of disease or given IV. Well, unfortunately, Kristen um, directed some people to go ahead and inject this into somebody's eye and they had some blindness from this and so this became a big issue and I do agree that it should never have been done. Um, and it, the FDA went ahead and had a hearing on this, but she continued to use this type of treatment for other things too, making a lot of claims about other diseases. And they felt that they should uh, challenge her and they brought her to court. And the judge ruled that she violated uh, all three basic concepts of what the FDA had a ruling on. And those are what are called uh, same surgical procedure, homologous use, uh, and minimal manipulation. So basically what those mean are that uh, that she did not use this in the same surgical procedure, uh, that, 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 that this did not protect her from uh, actually using the SBF. Also that homologous use, meaning that the, you don't have a deficiency of fat in your eyeball. So if you had a deficiency of fat, say from a breast reconstruction, it could be used there, but not in your eyeball. Uh, and then also minimal manipulation. She was using a, an enzyme to break down the fat 
and they said that that was more than minimal manipulation. And the judge upheld those orders saying that that is true, that um, all those three basic parameters were violated, and thus she had to stop doing what she's doing. But I think the key thing was is that the it's not that this was unsafe for everybody because S SBF has been used safely for a lot of other things, but it was just a poor choice of what she did that opened up the door. And then also to make a lot of false claims about a lot of other diseases that could be treated with this because there's a confusion between what an SBF is and cultured stem cells. So stem cells that are just purely stem cells that are grown in a lab are not, uh, are not, actually an SBF. An SBF has a lot of stem cells in it. It has a lot of other things in it, uh, but they, the two can't be compared. So I think that's at the bar of like, if we're going to talk about this, we need to go ahead and make sure we're talking the same language. That if we're saying SBF, everyone else is going to talk about SBF. If we're talking about cultured cells, we'll all talk about cultured, cultured cells. If we're going to talk about bone marrow aspirate, we'll talk all about bone marrow aspirate. So sorry about the, the long intro there, but that did give us a, a background of where the FDA and the US government is on the regulation of this, which I give a two thumbs up for because I think we need to go in that direction. So Tom, you, you've been doing this for a while. I'd like to get your viewpoint on this. I, I think, uh, thank you one for the introduction and uh, uh, two, I think you really uh, highlighted an important point that not all stem cells are the same. I get a lot of patients that come in and, and say they've had a stem cell treatment. Um, and if you discuss with them what they had done, uh, it doesn't meet what my standards would mean for truly defining a stem cell treatment. Uh, so that, that term stem cell is a very loose term that people use to mean various different things. And I think what we need to do a better job of is, is defining using more def definite terms like SVF or like bone marrow concentrate. Um, or like amniotic fluid injections to define exactly what was injected rather than just vaguely using the term stem cell. The problem is most people in the lay public don't know what all those other terms mean and they hear stem cell and are attracted to the power of stem cells. Um, and so we kind of get caught in this situation where we don't want to stop using the term because that's what people want us to use, but we need to start moving that conversation towards more specific terms. Yeah, I agree with that. A, a really good example for the public to get their uh, their um, hands around this, to actually understand this, is, you know, the, the FDA stands for food and drug. So they also regulate food. So this is the same problem they had with cheese. We all love cheese, right? And when you would have cheese spread, they had to go ahead and define what that really means so that someone would have proper labeling. So when the consumer would go out and want cheese, they would know that this is really cheese or is this really a processed cheese? So that's the same thing here that we're struggling with now in the early parts is that uh, we're all calling this cheese when it's not all cheese. It may be cheese whiz that they actually had injected rather than real 100% uh, Wisconsin grade cheese. So uh, that's a good example. I think that uh, the public can understand what the FDA is trying to do here. And I 100% agree with them that we need to quantify and specify uh, and verify what uh, patients are receiving. Um, and, and I think that gets into uh, a lot of con confusion or concern the patients have as to if these injections are so effective, why why don't why isn't there coverage for it? Um, mm -hmm. and, and that gets down to we need to define what's in our syringe, what we're injecting, what are, is the protocol we're going to follow for where the injections need to go, which are reasons that doctors like yourself and I really want to collaborate together. We need to collaborate together. Um, we need to do and, and, and be active through uh, various organizations that have that unified goal of pushing the science. And in order to do so, we need to one, know it's in a syringe and two, know where our needles tips are. Yes, that's true. Um, so th thinking about this, there's another group out there right now. Uh, it's called the Cell Surgical Network. Uh, it was founded by Dr. Uh, Berman out of uh, Hollywood, California, uh, who is a plastic surgeon. 
And uh, they are also using fat, and they're using the SBF from the fat. Uh, and they have a whole network, that's, that's why they're called the Cell Surgical Network, throughout the country where other physicians are doing this and using their protocols. Now, Dr. Berman, and his, this is the next case that's coming up in the U.S. courts, uh, feels that he has a strong case because now he has data, like you just discussed. So this is good that we talk about data. So he claims that he has the data uh, to win this case. My only concern is, is that data is, is, is what's called a registry. So a registry is not bad data, it's just not strong data. So what a registry is, is that I'm just going to register every single person that I've given this to, and I'm going to look at certain parameters. Well, the problem with that is that we don't always agree what those parameters are. Uh, and the FDA doesn't even agree on what all those parameters are. And then also you have patients that are lost in that registry. So they're not required to come back and you don't have to go ahead and make sure that you follow every single one of those. So if you claim that I have a 90% success rate, well, that may not be true because a lot of the patients that didn't do well went somewhere else. So you have to include everybody. And then also you don't have close monitoring to look for complications. You're just having them self-report the complication. So that's, that's part of the problem. And finally, you don't have a control. You don't know if they did really better than if you just injected saline into that area. So th that's, that's the issue. And I don't think that uh, the court is going to say that that's acceptable data, although it's, it's a good start. I hope you're liking Profiles and Cellular Healing. If you do like it, like us on Facebook, or if you have a question, go ahead and give us a question. We'll be more than happy to answer them for you. Because remember, these are your cells for your healing. I don't know if you have any comments about that. Yeah, I do. I mean, it, I would say just from, uh, um, it's, it's a good start. It's, it's some data, which is better than no data. Um, and, and the fact that he was using SVF, I think both of you and I would agree believe it, they don't want us using it. So, I mean, when it comes down to it, we're practicing in the United States. We need to practice within the guidance of, of the Food and Drug Administration, and their role is patient safety and, and public safety. Whether we think that that halts our progress in science, you know, the, there, there's always going to be that, that give and take with um, progressing a new treatment plan or a new treatment um, uh, science and what's safe for public use, because what we don't want is to have complications like what happened with those patients who were injected in their, in their retinas and, and they, you know, go blind. There, there are definite um, handcuffs necessarily to these um, rules like culture expansion. We can't culture expand. Um, that's something I would love to see the FDA uh, lift the ban on and have a regulatory body that makes sure that culture expanding is done in a safe, um, sterile environment, similar to they do for for uh, compounding uh, pharmacies, uh, I think that would really push the science. Once we can get our numbers up, our, our, our stem cell numbers, our mesenchymal um, stem cell numbers. Um, but right now they, they're telling us bone marrow is the source that we can use, and that's really what we need to stick with. So you bring up a good point about um, cultured cells and being able to, and this is for the public here, that you're gonna multiply those cells. And I just want to just spend about two minutes on that because I think that's a, that's a key thing and that may be a misperception. So uh, yes, there are studies out there where they just use stem cells alone that are grown in culture. And some people feel that that's the, that's the golden ticket, that's the magic bullet that we need to do. But uh, research out of China, and I've actually spoken and, and had uh, conversations with the person who's in charge of that program through China, because when you culture cells, guess what? You get to patent them. And so then you, you, you now have the right to that. So when they, when they compare it to autologous, meaning your own cells that are not cultured, uh, they just can't get the same results. So there isn't any superiority for what we treat in orthopedics. Now, this is maybe different for other things, but for orthopedics such as arthritis, there is no superiority and even the the bone marrow itself from your from your own body has done better uh, than if you have just cultured stem cells and also we believe 
like uh, Lisa Fortier out of uh, Cornell also believes, and Brian Cole out of Rush also believes, is that it's just not the stem cells. It's that mixture. It's that niche that that stem cell lives in. So that stem cell that lives in your bone marrow uh, has the stem cell, it has uh, the plasma proteins that are there, and it has the growth factors. So that mixture together is what gives us the, 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 the clinical benefit of that treatment. The other thing is um, uh, 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 about this is that why did the FDA get involved with cultured stem cells and why are they concerned about that? Well, what they found out is that after four passes, meaning that four different growths of that, uh, of that cell, it starts to change. It starts to morph a little bit because it's not in the natural environment that it normally grows in. And so they're concerned about that. That doesn't mean that it's gonna form cancer. They're just concerned about that because the cell morphology starts to change after four passes. Uh, and so now we gotta put a limit on that. And that's what's called a GMP or a good manufacturing process that you can say that that same cell hasn't really changed much from where it began to where it ended. And also that it's clean of you know, fungus and bacteria, uh, and then you count how many you have. So that's something that we're going towards. There's other ways of doing that through predictive models that we're working on, but you bring up a really good point there. And I just wanna make sure that the public understands that there isn't really a superiority of just giving you pure stem cells. Because again, we always think that the stem cells are the key, and it's not. Remember, God gave us these, these stem cells, and he gave it to us in a certain uh, proportion and percentage that's, that's perfectly perfected in your own bone. So, um, it, it, you know, going on from here, again, I think the FDA went ahead and chose these two groups here because not so much about the SDF because SDF is fairly safe, it, it is. But it was more about, they set out a guideline, and they set what the rules are gonna be, and they violated it. Not only did they violate it just because of SBF, they violated it because they made a lot of claims about a lot of other diseases that we don't have a lot of data on to, to, to validate what they're saying. So, uh, and, and at your center, you know, looking at your website and talking with you, you don't make those claims, right? No. We, no. we don't make a claim that unfortunately that, we get a lot of calls from very desperate people looking for treatments to their neurologic disease their cardiac disease their pulmonary disease and we just don't have that kind of treatment available yet that's that's one it's nothing that's um, approved for use in the united states but i haven't seen any uh, protocols that i i would want a family member to follow um, from a safety e efficacy standpoint yeah in, in this true because we're here to protect the public and to treat the public. And also everyone says this over and again, do no harm. Yeah. Do no harm. So we, and uh, so both of us, you know, on our websites, we don't make any claims about, uh, you know, this is going to cure uh, a disease that, uh, that this is going to treat um, any, any neurologic disease that comes by because it's kind of like saying that penicillin will treat every single infection. Right? right, we know it treats some, but it's not every single infection. So, um, you know, moving on here, um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing at 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 your center right now at uh, at the Michigan Center for Regenerative Medicine. So, yeah, I mean, you touched on it, but pretty much everything orthopedic. So, you have a degenerative orthopedic condition, a knee issue, a hip issue, a spine issue. Um, those are the types of things we see on a regular basis. Uh, we see some acute injuries, and I think there is some evidence coming out that there can be alternatives, regenerative alternatives to uh, most things you think of being scoped at this point, whether it's a MCL tear, a meniscus tear, um, uh, ACL tears even. Uh, we went to a recent IOF uh, training, um, uh, advanced training session, and, and they had a really uh, impressive technique for, for managing incomplete ACL tears. Um, uh, so those are the types of things that we tend to see here. A lot of spines, a lot of knees would be our top two conditions. Yeah. So, you know, all things that are, are within the guidelines of the FDA, not making any wild claims 
Uh, and I do agree with you. Uh, Chris Centeno is uh, a good friend. Uh, you're out at the IOF. Uh, he has pushed the limits a little bit uh, on certain things, but I think that he's reined himself in and realizes that he, we have to really be careful about uh, what we really say. Uh, so, um, Tom, if, if, let me just ask you this uh, real simple question for, for a closing here. If you had your wish, the one wish that you would have right now of what you would like to see your clinic do over the next five years, what would that be? I have that vision. That's a, that's a that seems like is a that was a prompted question, but it's not. No. So my vision is uh, trying to make it easy for interventional pain doctors to make the bridge from their current pain management practice to a regenerative medicine practice. So I I really see this as as the future for for patients that are suffering chronic pain conditions. Um, and right now, a lot of my colleagues, interventional pain colleagues are stuck where I, I was three years ago, just afraid to take that leap, um, kind of stuck doing the traditional pain management therapies, which aren't bad, but it's basically mask the pain, mask the pain, mask the pain, whether it's with a pill, whether it's with a brace or whether it's with an injection. We're not fixing the problem, we're just trying to mask the pain. Um, and they're stuck there for more than anything financial reasons. Um, they believe in regenerative medicine, they want to do it, they don't have the ability to pull out from their pain management practice, which is what's supporting their family and, and running their practice to invest in the correct technology to have the right um, regenerative lab so that they can then put the right su substance in the syringe and then inject it into the right, into the same spot where they're already injecting cortisone and lidocaine to mask the pain. So essentially they already have the, the correct needle skills. And so I wanted to try to create this clinic where they can come one day a week or one day a month or two days a month. They can just slowly build their comfort level, similar to what I did by going out and working with uh, Dr. Baumgartner at Rejuve um, to, to work side by side with somebody to, to get comfortable and then take their skills and just go do it somewhere else. I don't want to lock people into restricted covenants and this, any kind of these contracts that we try to trap each other in. I just want to give them a space where they can get comfortable with the technology, comfortable with their skills build a small patient base that they can then pluck and take to their own clinic or they can buy in and we can become partners whatever they want but more than anything just just spread the knowledge and give a, a appropriate place for the correct physicians to get comfortable with this skill because otherwise the problem is um, the people who are going to be attracted to this and who are going to really take the lead on stem cells aren't the ones that you want putting a needle in you they don't have the skills they don't have the background they're doing it for the money and the patients get a bad outcome. And, and I, I kind of alluded to it earlier, but I can't tell you how many patients have come to me for another opinion because they've already tried stem cells and it didn't work, but somebody told them they should come talk to me because what I'm doing is a little different. They didn't have stem cells. They had a guy pull something out of a freezer, probably amniotic fluid, bend over the table, give them an intramuscular injection and say, he just injected their back. He was nowhere close to their disc. He wasn't in their facet joint. He wasn't in their interspinous ligaments. That's the problem. That's the biggest threat to regenerative medicine. It's not the doctors who want to do it right. It's the doctors who or maybe not even doctors that, yeah. that are hiring nurse practitioners or PAs and, and yeah. misguiding them on where to put the needles. So, yeah, that's it's, it's, yeah, it's you're absolutely right. The, the bad players ruin it for a lot of us. And yep. we're just trying to do the right thing, the cautious thing. But when also, like you brought up, you do need to to jump out there. And just like if you're a, a fan of the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, where the Hobbit had to get out of his hole and you do have to, but when you get out of your hole, it's a great adventure. And um, this is something that it's a little unexplored, but we have to trust in the Lord. We have to trust in ourselves that this is the right thing, because th this is coming from our own bodies. Uh, this is what the good Lord gave us to go ahead and and, and we're trying to make the, the best of it. Uh and so um, in, in, in final closing here, again, Thomas Nabity, Michigan Center for Regenerative Medicine in Rochester Hills. The phone number is 248-216-1008. That's 248-216-1008. And they're at regenerativemedicinemichigan.com. 
And Tom, I hope that we have a chance to talk again because we're right-minded people. And I totally agree with you. God bless you. We'll go ahead and, and summarize this online. And we hope to see you next time because remember, these are your cells for your healing. Thanks for joining us on Profiles and Cellular Healing. Don't forget to go ahead and like us on Facebook or subscribe to us on YouTube. Or you can go ahead and contact us through CellularHealing.net. Remember, these are your cells for your healing.